Those of you who have been following our channel for a while will know how highly we value a good monitoring environment, with both the speakers and the room they're in playing an equal part. Over the last few years, a few room correction DSP platforms have come along to help in the effort to get your listening space as technically accurate as possible, in terms of spectral response at least. The three most prevalent in studio world would be Sonarworks, or SoundID as it's becoming known, Dirac Live and Trinov. These three systems work by using measurement microphones and algorithms to determine any problem frequencies in your room and then aim to counteract them accordingly using DSP. Dirac Live costs around £250 for the stereo version or £365 for the multi-channel version. Sonarworks or SoundID costs £82 for the headphones only version, £207 for the headphones and speakers version and £249 if you want a calibrated measurement microphone included with the bundle. Trinov is the most expensive, with the entry-level ST2 Pro at around £5,100, going up to the Dolby Atmos-capable 64-output MC-HCC at around £12,000. So we're talking professional-level pricing here. But is it worth it, and considering we've not yet found one of the software systems that has impressed us enough to actually use it in anger, will Trinov change our minds on room correction? A big thank you to Paul Mortimer from Emerging UK for loaning us the Trinov ST2 Pro for a few weeks to try out. We aren't sponsored at all and we have not been paid to make this video and we do unfortunately have to return the unit at the end of the review. As ever, we'll give our honest opinion based on serious time spent actually working with the unit. Despite the slightly Eastern Bloc sounding name, Trinov is actually a French company formed in 2003, the founding partners having worked on fundamental research into high spatial resolution audio since the year 2000 at ERCAM in Paris, one of the world's leading public research facilities dedicated to music creation and acoustics. The name Trinov actually means 3D innovation, derived from Try meaning three and the in of of innovation. Of course, being French, the first production units only worked one day a week, shut down for lunch for five hours and regularly went on strike. But a firmware update has since fixed this and UK distributors emerging have added a plugin to the UK versions that prevents them from trying to steal our fish. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to cut out, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. No, uh, I'll keep it. There's nothing you can't joke about as long as it's a joke. The Trinov team now consists of 45 passionate and talented individuals spread across six time zones. And spoiler alert, this thing is fantastic. So let me hand back to James for an overview of the unit before I get myself in any more trouble. Let's take a closer look at the ST2 Pro, starting with the hardware. This 2U rack unit has four simultaneous processing channels, meaning you can either run two pairs of speakers at once or one main monitor system with two optimized subs as part of that system. It's essentially a rack mounted computer running its own Trinov distribution of the Linux operating system that can either be controlled remotely via VNC or from a dedicated app or directly via keyboard, mouse and monitor plugged into the back, which is how we choose to use it. If you can hear the cat snoring, it's very loud. Placing the ST2 Pro at the last stage of your monitoring chain before the speaker amplification stage will allow the system to correct both the spectral response and phase alignment of your monitoring system without adding any latency to headphone mixes, although the in-out delay added by the Trinov once calibrated to our system was only 17.6 milliseconds. On the cheaper Dirac Live and Sonarworks systems, you buy a separate measurement microphone, place it in particular positions within your room, and the software works out the response curves of your room by playing various sweeps of sine wave tones, pink noise, and more to work out how each frequency behaves in each particular position in your listening space. The problem with Dirac and Sonarworks is that user error can be a factor. Although the software guides you on where to place the microphone when testing each spatial position, the margin for error is small. It can take a considerable amount of time to perform the calibration process, and many users report very different results from multiple, seemingly identical, calibrations. The wavelength of a 10 kHz frequency is 34 mm. Therefore, if your hand shakes anything from 8 to 17 mm, which really isn't much at all, those frequencies could be between 90 and 180 degrees out of phase. Of course, this is why multiple measurements are conducted throughout the room. It reduces the overall risk of user error by averaging the results of each position. But the Trinov calibration process is a very different beast indeed. 
Both James and myself were shocked at the calibration process. My first reaction was, is that it? You pay 700 quid for a microphone that you might only ever use for two minutes. And then I remembered that this is a professional product and it's designed to enable professionals to stop faffing around and get back to work. And clearly an enormous amount of research has gone into the calibration process to make it incredibly fast, incredibly accurate and something even an idiot like me can perform. Not only is it fast, but it removes any scope for operator error almost entirely. And this is in part down to the unique design of this, the 3D microphone. Each microphone is tested in the factory to calculate its own spectral response. And when setting up the Trinov system in your studio for the first time, you're prompted to load the files that come on a USB stick into the Trinov computer. These contain the 3D microphone's own unique calibration file, so the system can then compensate for any discrepancies in the measurement microphone itself to avoid letting those color the end result. Paul kindly set up the system and initially performed a couple of calibrations in order to be able to tweak the microphone position and be able to place it as accurately as possible for the final calibration. The calibration process consists of three MLS bursts through each speaker, and that's it. It literally takes two minutes. It's important as a first step to make sure the microphone's turned off. The Trinov mic functions as an open mic and is powered by a nine volt battery. So you're gonna get some extremely loud feedback if you aren't careful with it. You're prompted on screen when you should turn the microphone on or off. So if you're in doubt, keep it turned off until Trinov tells you otherwise. The default noise output level of Trinov is zero dB. So this is going to be extremely loud on a powerful sound system. So the first job here should be to turn it way down. Something like minus 30 dB is a good start. Then we can slowly turn the volume up until the noise generated by the software is loud enough to excite the room acoustically. Around minus eight decibels worked in our room here. Then place the microphone where your head will be when sitting in your listening position. You should be directly in line with the center of your speaker setup if you're running a stereo system. Also ensure that the microphone is flat in the lateral plane. Using graphs displayed after a test tone on the Trinov user interface, you can then fine tune the position of the mic to get the correct distance and angle from each speaker. After getting this initial setup perfected, Trinov will play three three second long maximum length sequence or MLS bursts per speaker in the system. And that's it. It's literally that easy. The MLS burst tones are a mixture of pink noise and modulating sine wave and provide the 3D microphone with enough information to determine everything, including spectral response, phase coherence, and even the angle of the speakers in 3D space in just a couple of seconds. This works by having the four elements of the mic in a tetrahedral shape. As a sound wave passes the microphone, the time between that sound hitting the first element to the other three elements is calculated, as well as any audio characteristics that may change between each microphone. And this then provides the algorithm with the right data to analyze the room. Once it's completed the necessary maths and the user hits the compute button, after a few seconds, Trinov will provide a graph showing the before spectral and phase responses and after graphs showing the same information post correction. So let's talk for a minute about the frequency response of this room and the speakers in it. We know that this room causes a roughly 4 dB peak at 50 Hertz and a 12 dB or so dip at 150 Hertz at the listening position. And that's because when I decided to make this my mastering room and we put the ATCs in here, I spent a couple of days experimenting with the listening position in regard to the bass response and positioned myself in the flattest area of the room. If I stand and listen in a corner, then the bass is all over the place, but that's exactly where I want the bass all over the place, in a corner, not here. If we look at the optimizer graph from the Trinov calibration, we can see that it's clearly showing the 50 Hertz bump and the 150 Hertz dip. The 50 Hertz is easy to deal with. It's just a simple cut but the 150 dip we have to be careful with and this applies even more so to those of you working at home on smaller speakers and running something like Sonarworks. If we boost that dip we still have a 150 hertz dip at the listening position that we're fighting and on lesser monitors we run the risk of running out of headroom and even damaging them if we pump through
through enough extra energy at 150 hertz. So the answer here, and this applies to any frequency-based room correction system, is to learn from those initial measurements and try and do something about the dips or peaks in your low end with bass trapping rather than just boost them back up again. With 150 hertz having a wavelength of around 230 centimeters, we'd need to add around a 60 centimeter thickness of absorption to even begin to absorb that. So for us, the best option would be to invest in a couple of PSI AVA active bass traps and place those in the corners of the room where that 150 hertz dip is actually a massive peak and absorb it and then calibrate again and experiment with the positioning of the traps to get that before graph as flat as it can be in the low end. But as it is, the ATC amplifiers have a ton of headroom. So for this review, Paul advised us that it would be fine to split the difference and boost that 150 hertz up a little so as we only have a dip of three to four dB. And this is an awesome feature of the Trinov. You can customize its suggested frequency response curve. But why would you want to do that? I hear you ask, shouldn't we just trust what it says, well, we're of the opinion that flat isn't always good, and we can see that the second issue the Trinov revealed is that we have a substantial dip at three and a half kilohertz. Our acoustic treatment in here is very effective down to around 600 hertz and to a slightly lesser extent from 600 down to around 200. So pretty much any issue from 600 up is likely to be down to the speakers and desks or surfaces in front of them and not necessarily down to the room itself. The ATC mid driver and tweeter cross over at 3.5 kilohertz, as do many similar three-way models from other manufacturers. And the Aldax tweeters response used in the SCM200 and 300 models tails off significantly below here. So I would speculate that the dip is a combination of design, driver response, and the crossover point. But Paul has set up Trinovs on a lot of ATC systems and was fully expecting the dip and did point out that we might not like it boosted up to be flat. And sure enough, we didn't. There is something very nails down a blackboard, scratchy and horrible about 3.5 kilohertz that just didn't sound right flattened out on these particular monitors. When we heard that frequency flat, it sounded like we'd boosted 3.5 kilohertz with a really horrible EQ. So again, we split the difference and were much happier with that result. The left and right speakers were also slightly different, particularly in the tweeter response, but this is something that can easily be tweaked with the amplifier settings on the SCM 200s. Whilst researching this video, I spoke to several acousticians and a couple of well-respected studio designers who all agreed that frequency response should rarely be flat in a critical listening environment and that it's very important to establish a target curve and that that is very unlikely to be flat and is very subjective. A speaker that measures flat in an anechoic chamber most certainly will not measure flat in a regular room and directivity alongside many other factors can have a big influence on how our ears perceive frequency response and this is a very personal thing and can involve a lot of work to get right. In many studios where the engineer is uncertain about the sound they have in their monitoring environment they get many returns or revision requests on their mixes or masters but when things are properly tuned and a suitable target curve for that person in that room with those speakers is established, most of these problems go away. The engineer is then confident in their sound, revisions drop, happy bunny. So certainly for us in this room, flat is not good, but it varies from speaker to speaker and room to room. The Kerr Acoustic K100 sounded best in this room, largely flat, but with a gentle roll off from around four kilohertz up. At Kerr HQ, they sound better without that roll off. Let's move on and look at one aspect of the Trinov system that neither Sonarworks or Dirac even feature. And this is where you really get your money's worth, phase. This is where the Trinov really blew our minds. The importance of time aligning speakers and the drivers within them is widely understood, but Trinov take things one step further and have made the point since 2005 that time aligning frequencies is also essential for improving the soundstage and transient reproduction. And this is something that can't be achieved with acoustic treatment and an area in which the Trinov excels. Quite how it does it is beyond our comprehension and even beyond Paul's comprehension. And it has been said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's certainly the case here. In an oversimplified nutshell, what the Trinov is doing is equalizing the phase to focus the impulse response and bring the frequency elements that are smeared in time together into one coherent impulse. The result of this is stereo imaging and depth perception that is frankly incredible. 
This was excellent before the Trinov performed its magic, although not as good as we experienced with the Kerr Acoustic K100s, which had a truly three-dimensional sphere of sound emanating from them that you could almost taste. But on the ATCs, the Trinov gave us that and then some. Lead vocals that were vaguely there suddenly were right there, and it felt like you could reach out and touch them. But after having spent several hours listening to our regular reference tracks, it was apparent that it didn't sound good on everything. And that's because the Trinov had taken a phenomenon common to high-end studio monitoring and exacerbated it. The bad sounded worse, but the good sounded really good. It had taken those two poles and moved them even further apart. But listening is only half the story. When the Trinov really earns its keep is when you start working with it. I'll be the first to admit that I was skeptical of this unassuming and frankly f***ing ugly box and kind of hoping I'd hate it, mainly because it's French, but also because it's five grand. And I wasn't sure on first impressions and on listening to our usual reference tracks, but then I spent a couple of weeks working with it and regularly bypassing it to see what differences it made. For mastering, sonically, it actually made very little difference to my output. I found I was mastering tracks in pretty much the same way as I had been without it, albeit much faster. But it was with a handful of mixes and the stem mastering I had in for clients that made the biggest difference, particularly when judging elements like reverb tails, delay and depth. And it was in these aspects that the Trinov showed its asking price as actually a bit of a bargain considering the enormous amount of R&D that must have gone into developing it. Everyone I've spoken to using one of these, they've all said it's a game changer. They wish they'd bought one years before they did, it will be the last thing to leave their rack, and it's not only up their audio game another notch, but they're also working faster with fewer revisions, mixes are translating much better, and well, that's what it's all about. It's not often that something with the word pro on its front panel actually truly means that but this does it really does and it's the one thing that we've reviewed on this channel so far that I really really don't want to send back and here's why we pivoted our business during the pandemic and sold a lot of our recording and live gear to streamline what we do and to finance this very YouTube channel. And if I've got five grand hanging around in my back pocket, then first on the shopping list is camera, lighting and computer upgrades to improve and drastically speed up the workflow for these videos, which take an enormous amount of time and effort to put together. And James is editing these videos. That's his job now. But anyone familiar with AdSense revenue will know that that doesn't pay the bills until you get up into hundreds of thousands of subscribers and millions of views territory. So my mastering work is having to pay me, him, and pay for the building and look after the cat. And that's tough. It's two full-time jobs. And as much as I love it and I'm absolutely not complaining and feel incredibly privileged to be able to do what I am, my average working day has been six in the morning to nine, 10, sometimes 11 o'clock at night for the past three or four months, seven days a week. And that isn't sustainable long-term. This magic Trinov box in the first few weeks we've had it has shaved three to four hours off my day. The quality of my work is the same, if not better, but I'm getting it done in half the time. And revisions, there haven't been any, and I've been starting work at six in the morning because I love it, but finishing at around 6 p.m. This box deserves the pro badge. But as with sonar works and the cheaper room correction systems, it's no substitute for good acoustic treatment and the better the room, the better the monitors, the better results you'll get from this. But unlike the other systems out there, it does do something that no acoustic treatment can with time alignment and that is where it really has impressed us. The calibration process is underwhelming, almost disappointingly simple, but again, that is what you're paying for. Follow the instructions this gives you and an idiot can set it up in minutes, even Mark. If your studio monitoring is already good and your room is already well treated and you're working professionally, you need to check this out. But beware, once you've found your own personal target curve and this has done its thing, it won't be going back. Pick up the off. I've got an idea. Okay. Grab the rope. All right. What's the difference between Ali from Emerging and this apple? What? This apple isn't tied up in a bag in my carriage. <laughs> <laughs> shall we uh, plug the Trinoff back in again? God, yeah, I think we should. Hold on. Oh, fine. Okay. You're going to edit the video for me? No, just 
flop all over the chair. It's fine. Not like I need to sit there or anything. It's fine. Ooh, all stretchy pieces. Wake up. Oh, hello. Oh, fluffy. Hello, Look at all that fluff. Fluff. Look at all that fluff. Like. 